Also, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we are uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, we are uh, the two of us are from the Android Emerging Markets team in Facebook. Uh, I'm Alex Surov, the uh, the manager of the Emerging Market team, and here is. My name is Alex Petrescu, and I'm a software engineer uh, on the Emerging Markets team, and I focus on newsfeed. And today we're going to talk about what we do uh, to make Android apps look uh, work better on less powerful devices and less powerful networks. So first of all, why we care about Emerging Markets. So we have uh, almost 450 million users uh, using the app on a daily basis. Uh, and these users are everywhere, and we want to connect users all over the world. As a matter of fact, Android, uh, our Android users in particular are uh, located uh, all over the world. Nine out of 10 of our users are located outside of the United States. Uh, and most of the new users who come online are also coming online in places which are emerging markets. Uh, we have a lot of people who, for the first time, actually getting internet connections. Uh, and of course, Facebook wants to connect everybody, and there is an ongoing effort to do that. Uh, our job is to make sure these users work very well with uh, Facebook for Android app uh, where they are. You know, and where they are typically, you know, with no offense for uh, iOS users, are Android devices, usually cheap Android devices, and network which are not very powerful. So we're going to talk about devices first. Uh, does anybody here uh, care to guess how many different Android devices are out there in the market? Just a number. 500, 1,000, 10,000. Uh, the right answer is 10,000. You got that. So there are about 10,000 devices. And actually, the number keeps increasing. Uh, so that, that is about. You know, six, uh, you know, six months ago, it was about 10,000. I'm not even sure what, the, what it is right now. Uh, and of course, the challenge is, how do we actually test and how do we reason about 10,000 devices? They're all very different. Well, the way we reason about them is that we come up with this approach called device year class. Uh, so what's, what's device year class? Quite simply, it's uh, no matter when the device was produced, it's the year at which this device with those characteristics would have been the flagship device on the market. So here's how it works. Like Moto E here is the recent device, pretty popular device uh, from Motorola, of course. Uh, came out in 2014, but it has those characteristics. It has two CPU cores, 1.2 gigahertz clock speed, and one gigabyte of RAM. Uh, and let's compare it with Galaxy S2, which is a very popular device from 2011. Uh, has very similar characteristics as far as these three characteristics go. And in 2011, that was the flagship device. So as a result, we're going to say, hey, both of those devices are year class 2011 devices. Uh, and again, there are many different characteristics we could have looked at. Uh, we looked at, and we looked at all of them. And we thought that these three characteristics are the ones that makes the most difference in terms of the performance of the app and how users are able to uh, interface with the app. Uh, so these are the actual settings uh, that set up that we look at for these three parameters. And here's how we determine whether the device is in one year class or another. Uh, on some devices, you know, you are not going to get the exact match. We go for two out of three. If two out of three actually match uh, the year class, we call, call those devices you know, from that year class. And that's been a really useful metric for us. Uh, it's been useful for us because all of a sudden we can classify this whole world of 10,000 devices into smaller groups. And we can reason about them more easily. So once we actually got this data, uh, we started seeing some interesting trends. And I'll let Alex talk about that. So we developed the concept of year class uh, a couple years ago. It's mostly just a simple library um, that we've even open sourced for other developers to be able to introduce this, uh, this into their apps. And once we looked at the data, uh, we gathered a few months of data. Um, somewhere around last year, we saw that about a third of all devices will, will we consider 2010 devices. These are mostly gingerbread devices. Uh, you only have one core, um, less than a gigahertz uh, a clock, um, and then usually also other slow characteristics like s uh, small um, uh, cache size and things like that. Um, another third are 2011 devices, and these are better devices. They have two cores, but still not a lot of clock speed not a lot of a RAM, um, but it seemed that was the majority of users. Um, so we call 2010 and 2011 typical um, Android devices because they were the majority of the market. And then the ones that we have in our pockets, those are the, the modern phones, the high-end phones, the, the, the 2012. You have more than a couple of cores, uh, more than a gig of RAM, things like that. Now, good news is that this year, 
2010 has shrunk. So there's a lot less gingerbread devices. There's a lot less single core devices. Um, however, the 2011 class um, is now the most popular one and continues to grow. Most of the devices sold in emerging markets where they're selling millions and millions, um, they're mostly uh, on the 2011 side. So still only two cores, um, which is a challenge. It's a little bit better for the United States. Uh, very few or fewer gingerbread users and single core devices, but still more than a third of users are on 2011 devices. So if you're building an app, you still need to care and you care about any sort of adoption outside of major markets, um, you, do, you should care about these type of uh, devices. So as engineers, instead of, oh shoot, sorry, I'm bad at this. One second. How do I go back? <laughs> okay. Bam. Got it. All right. So as engineers, instead of worrying about 10,000 different devices, now you really only need to worry about eight. And honestly, you only need to worry about two or three. You need to have a 2011 device. You need to have a 2010 device, like a Pocket Neo. And then you need to have the device that's in your pocket, which is usually four cores or more and um, a decent speed. So now that we talked about the diversity of devices, I mean, the next sort of uh, place where there's a lot of diversity in terms of usage is uh, diversity of network conditions. It's, in some ways, it's even more complicated than diversity of devices. Uh, this is kind of the basic graph here uh, that shows you a very basic breakdown on network conditions. And this is just by Wi-Fi uh, and cellular you know, worldwide. Uh, you know, most of the connections, of course, this is, this is uh, from Facebook data and, you know, sessions of Facebook app. Uh, most of the connections out there on Wi-Fi, you know, there are quite a few cellular, and then about 2% worldwide uh, actually connect uh, where there is no connection whatsoever. Uh, I mean, there might be different reasons for that. Users might have turned off the mobile data, or they're in an area where there is no mobile data, uh, or they in the area which is very congested and they can't get to the tower. Uh, all of these are reasons for not having any connections at all. So that's simple enough. But when you break it down by countries, you'll see that you know, there's a wide variety uh, of different conditions. Even if you look just at those three, you know, Wi-Fi, cellular, and no connection whatsoever, uh, you know, these profiles vary a lot. But it actually is even more complicated with that, than that, as I think probably everybody notices that you know, wi -Fi, one Wi-Fi is not like another Wi-Fi. And uh, you know, one cellular connection is not like another cellular connection. And so we uh, took the page out of device year class work, and we thought, hey, could we actually do something similar for network connections? Could we actually uh, uh, break it down into easy to understand classifications that you know, we can then use uh, to reason about them and to make improvements uh, for different network connections. Uh, and the idea we came up with is uh, network connection class. And again, this is something we open source and others can use as well. Uh, but in general, this is uh, fairly straightforward. We are doing a passive measurement of the bandwidth. Like as the app uh, sends the packets and receives them, uh, we keep track of how long it takes and we measure bandwidth. We throw out small packets because the overhead is actually, uh, you know, starts dominating. And we only look for something which is more than a certain, certain, certain size. And then we get these data points. We get these data points all over the place. You know, the mobile connections are, you know, sort of notoriously, uh, you know, uh, unreliable. Uh, and at any given time, you can be, you can have a really good connection and a really bad connection, especially if you're moving around. So we average. So we looked at different methods of averaging, and we le landed with a geometric averaging. So essentially, uh, we break the space of all the bandwidth into two categories. They're all about 4x from each other. Uh, moderate and poor connections are the lowest ones, and then good and excellent. Uh, and then, you know, we label them. Uh, again, we, to, to label them and understand those boundaries, we'll look at the data again. We wanted to find the boundaries which are actually meaningful. So as the user moves from one connection class to another, it results in a meaningful change to, you know, performance or meaningful change in how the user can actually interact with the apps. So this is the one we came up with, uh, you know, for the open source library, we just, you know, label them as uh, poor, moderate, good, and excellent, because in the future, we might actually change what the boundaries are. But we found that these four are just great groups for engineers to think about and target their app towards. Alex? So, um, like Alex mentioned, uh, what we found is technology does not imply speed. Uh, and this is pretty apparent to anyone that's actually traveled and try to use hotel Wi-Fi or try to go into an internet cafe or something like that. Just because you're on Wi-Fi does not mean that you're on, on a good, fast connection. So when you're thinking about gating very expensive features like, I don't know, autoplay videos or uh, HD videos or things like that, um, you can't just use 
um, that you're on Wi-Fi or not on Wi-Fi, because that doesn't really tell you anything. Um, again, it doesn't. If you're on LTE connection or a 3G connection, you might have one bar or something. Like it's, it's. You're still not getting a, a, a good amount of speed. So, for example, in India and in the United States, the same download can take four times longer or be four times faster in the United States on average than in India for the same connection type. So this is what. Android gives you. Android tells you you're on Wi-Fi, you're on mobile, you're on edge, um, you're on LTE, but it doesn't really tell you what the quality is or how fast you're getting packets um, uh, to and from your server. So as developers, we need to build one app, usually, that has to work on both six megs a second and essentially 56K modem speeds. So it's uh, quite a challenge for uh, developers and connection classes, something we've um, developed to help us tackle these types of issues. And you know, this is a talk about tails and some, some things that we find out which might not be uh, obvious. And this is one of those things. Uh, in general, if you were to have a conditional in your, in your app and say, hey, uh, if I think about Japan, do I think about bad connections or do I think about good connections? I think just everybody would agree that you're thinking about good connections, really good connections for most users in Japan. But when we gra put this data uh, and started looking at this data, uh, we found this. So uh, at the end of every month, about 10% of users in Japan switch from excellent connections to not so great connections, poor and moderate connections. So uh, we're sort of wondering why. Uh, and the title kind of gives it away uh, as to why this happens, the title of the slide. Uh, what we think is happening is that basically users are either on prepaid plans or they're basically throttled by their carrier when they use too much data. Uh, and so, again, if you are just looking at the country or the type of the connection by fire cellular, you're probably missing out on some group of the population which actually doesn't quite fit the profile. So you guys have seen this slide a few slides ago, um, and we talked about um, the different uh, breakdowns. And what I'd like to point out is now the intermittency issue, is that there's a certain time, no matter what country you're in, no matter what, uh, it's, um, what network you're on, where you turn on your app and for some reason you don't have a, ne a network right now. This is obviously a much bigger problem in places like India and Nigeria, where something like 20% of all app startups do not have any network at all. Uh, but still, ev even in the United States, we've all been on the subway, on the bus, or something like that, where there's no connection right now. And even though you have a network connection, or Android will tell you you have a network connection, what we found is uh, packets will go out, and then they'll just essentially just go into a black hole somewhere, and then never come back. Nothing comes back. So about what we found is like 20% of all network requests fail. Uh, and this is while the app is in the foreground, so we know that the user is trying to use the app. While the app is in the background, it could be 50, 60% um, if you're trying to make a network request while it's in the background. So uh, in addition to that, I mean, we, we believe that improvements, especially on the networking side, are going to take some time. Uh, so 2G is being phased out in the US, which is great news, but it's going to be around in the developing uh, in the emerging market pl uh, places for a while, you know, at least for a few years. But that's not even the whole problem. The, the bigger problem is the congestion. Because uh, if you go to the emerging market place and, you're, and you try the 3G over there, what will you often find that 3G is not like our 3G here. Uh, and the reason is it's, it's really congested and it's not reliable. Uh, and, uh, you know, congestion comes from a lot of people using the networks. Uh, and, you know, more and more people are getting online. More and more people are using internet for the first time, and this fantastic news. Uh, unfortunately, the infrastructure is not catching up with that. Uh, so we expect that the congestion issues are going to continue, uh, and the networks are not going to get any more reliable anytime soon. And uh, here's our tale of the uh, connectivity in the Facebook Hyderabad office. Uh, so as an emerging market teams, we make trip to emerging market countries pretty regularly. And this year, we really focused on India because we wanted to solve, to understand and solve a lot of problems in that market. Uh, so we went there uh, twice so far. We went there in January and we went there in July. And when we went there in Janu January, we were disappointed. Uh, you know, the connection was too good. Uh, you got 3G speeds. Uh, you know, the office happens to be in a high-tech part of the town. And, you know, they got a lot of cell towers over there, a lot of high-tech companies. So generally, the connection was excellent. Uh, and it was like, oh, that's too bad. We can't really get a representative sample right there. So we, we had to fan out of the office and go to, like, more remote areas and stay in the cafes and coffee shops and just basically see what the connectivity is like, try to analyze the pattern, try to analyze what apps works and what don't. Uh, so uh, when we came in July, things reversed. 
all of a sudden in the office the conditions were not that great. Or oh, actually for us they were great. We got this juicy con you know intermittency and bad latencies and everything. Uh, and so uh, we asked uh, we asked Airtel, you know, which is one of the biggest uh, cell providers over there, what's going on? And they said, well, is there any more construction in the area that happened between January and July? Uh, and sure enough, there are two new office buildings right next door. I said, well, that's probably between two and six thousand people there. So that's what happens. You know, all of a sudden your network is congested, and we're like. Well, what are you guys going to do about this? They said, well, we'll put a new cell tower in the area, but it takes about six to nine months to put a new cell tower in the area. And so in the meantime, that's what you're going to get. Uh, so that was actually pretty eye-opening. Like, we tend to think about progress as linear. Uh, you know, things are just improving. And, you know, in reality, it goes kind of like that, right? Uh, I mean, the, uh, sometimes things have to get worse than, you know, before they get better. Uh, and Hyderabad is particularly interesting in that because if you look at this chart over there about population growth in Hyderabad, uh, the city has been growing really fast. So not only are a lot of people coming online for the first time, adding to this congestion, I mean people moving around and you know, when that happens, you know, more and more people come to one place, they overwhelm the infrastructure. Yeah, a, a, a point about that one, so the last data point is 2011, they've added another 3 million people in the last four years. So this year or last year, they had 9 million people. So they added as many people in the last uh, three years or four years as they added to the previous 10 years before that. So Actually, another interesting anecdote about this is that if you, if you go to a rural area in India, as long as you stay to a major highway, when you leave a large city, your connection improves. Because you know, along the major highways, you know, connectivity is actually pretty decent, and congestion start getting less and less. So, like just outside of the cities, as long as you stick to the major highway, you actually have really good connectivity. So this is everyday life uh, for most people in emerging prob uh, em emerging markets. However, um, the more we looked at this, uh, the more we realized this is not really just an emerging markets problem. Uh, this is really uh, a subway problem. This is a crowded stadium problem. It's a crowded conference problem. This is a road trip problem. This is an airplane problem. Uh, or if you're in New York City or somewhere around, it's your bad reception in your house. Um, so all of these, it's essentially issues boil down to like when you're building mobile apps, uh, the network is your enemy. It doesn't really matter how good your phone is. Uh, if you're on a bad network or you happen to be in a situation where you're on a bad network right now, um, your experience, your user's experience, are, is going to be pretty terrible. So uh, when we think about how we address this issue, especially for the network issue, we kind of break it down into different classes. Uh, one is the strategies for modern phones. You know, phone is, uh, is not a limitation, it's not a constraint, uh, but network is, like how do we deal with that? And the other one is the situation where your phone is actually is a limitation. So we're gonna uh, start talking about the strategies for modern phone first. So phones that actually have storage, phones that have pretty good CPU, uh, and phones that generally look like, you know, this computers, uh, you know, the desktop computers of five years ago, even better than that. So the easiest thing you can do is uh, cache the data that you download. So this is very important um, when you're trying to, especially for images and uh, a lot of things that um, take a lot of bytes over the wire. But it's also important for just simple responses like from your servers um, for like metadata and things like that. Um, and the reason this is because you, the user might wake up the app and they might have a network connection right now. Or you might have downloaded um, data yesterday for a view that they're clicking today. So try to cache as much data as possible. You have the hardware on the device. You have the, the storage. Um, your users will generally thank you uh, for it. Also, uh, since you have CPUs and you have cores and threads uh, that are available, try to pre-process your media before uploading. If you're going to use a photo on a site and it's going to be like, I don't know, 1,000 pixels, um, don't upload a 5 megapixel or 10 megapixel image from the device. It doesn't make any sense to then throw 99% of the bytes away once they get to the server. Uh, Pre-process it first on, on, on the client and then upload it. Do it in the background, obviously. Tell the user that you're doing stuff so he knows why his phone is hot. But it's, do it on the device. Um, and then make sure, essentially, any time you're posting, you serialize and you queue these up in the background. So never require network to post data. So if I'm uploading a bunch of photos, allow me to essentially queue those up right now, because that's when I want to do it right now. And then you do it in the background whenever you have a connection. Don't make me essentially wait and look for a spinner. Um, and then use the threads. Um, Especially, uh, like for example, things like view inflation is very expensive, right? It takes a while, especially on older phones. 
If you need data for that view, start the, the network fetch literally as early as possible. Um, maybe sometimes even on the screen beforehand. Um, so by the time that the U is loaded, they don't have to wait those extra 500 milliseconds uh, a, a second uh, to do that. So next, uh, use the network cleverly. So we talk about caching. Uh, if you have a good cache, one thing you could do is prefetch data. So prefetching is, comes in different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, it could mean like uh, prefetch for the next 30 seconds um, of interactions or three minutes of, of interactions or prefetch for later on today or a, 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 if it's like a notification or something like that. So, and then maximize the usage of the network when it's available. If you have a connection right now, you know you need to get a bunch of data for a list view or something like that. Try to get it all at once. There's many different reasons for this. Mostly mobile networks are bursty, so once you get a connection, it's great. You have data, stuff are gonna come like uh, 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 over the network very quickly. Um, and also, once it's done, then the radio can go to sleep. So that will use less battery usage and um, uh, your users will be happy too. But when you're prefetching, you're doing all this extra stuff, you need to make sure you prioritize uh, cancel requests if the user switches and does something else. Uh, if you predicted that they're gonna scroll in the list and they decide to click on something, cancel all the requests that you've currently uh, are doing for the list. Um, trunk responses, especially this is, I talk a lot about lists because I work on newsfeed. Lists are my life. Um, so, uh, you know, like if, if you need the data for 10 stories, um, and you're on a fast connection, that's great. Wait till you get those 10 stories because it's only gonna take you a few hundred milliseconds. Um, however, if you're on a slow connection, you only need like two stories or maybe five rows of data in order to show to the user. So just tell the server, give me the first five, let me process it, and then give me a, the rest in the background. So you can return those first few responses to the UI very, very quickly. Um, these type of things are great optimizations for just user experience. Um, keep your requests small, um, especially when you're sending. Um, packet size matters. Um, usually I think it's like one and a half kilobytes or something like that. Try to, to fit your request inside of that. So that has the highest likelihood of actually getting to your server quickly. And then this is a hyper optimization, but something that's actually quite important. DNS is quite unreliable for some reason. So even though the user has an active connection and if you connect via IP, it works fine, um, often DNS servers will fail and it's really, really lame. Um, I think like one of the optimizations, I think WhatsApp or something uh, it's, uh, has done, but it's like a great way to essentially just have a fallback. If you can't do a DNS resolution, try to fall back to something else, it might work um, and it'll be a great for your user. And uh, you know, prefetching doesn't come without its challenges. I think uh, anybody who actually tried that knows. Uh, you know, the challenges are fairly obvious. I mean, it's server CPU, uh, data costs, uh, better usage, storage, uh, and it, it can get in the way of your interactive uh, interactions with the user, right? Even if you're trying to prefetch when uh, the user is not doing anything, they can start at any moment. And you know, sometimes canceling those fetches uh, uh, is not cheap. So uh, you know, prefetching uh, is inherently probabilistic, right? Because you're basically guessing that the user is going to use the data. Uh, and that's where most of the challenges are going to come from because, you know, if you guess wrong, you just you know, incur all this cost without any benefit. So to deal with that, uh, you know, uh, we do, we'll talk a little bit about what smart prefetching looks like. So smart prefetching, because there's lots of challenges. Um, use the cache data creatively. Um, it's in our app, for example, when you wake up the app initially, we'll show you stories you've already downloaded. Um, we're starting to essentially show you stories that we have in your cache, but you've never seen before. So there's no reason to show you something that we already have and, and wait for the network. Um, and then this is great because in offline mode, um, you can still open up our app, you can scroll through your newsfeed, you can like and comment. Uh, there won't be any fresh stories, obviously you still need a network for that, but there'll be stories relatively recently. Um, and then if you can normalize the data, you might have different endpoints that return different pieces of the story, right? You might have a list view that returns like part of the data and then a detail view that has more data. Um, so essentially, take the data from the list view and put it on top of your detail view while you're loading the rest of the data. So and it, it's, if the user essentially doesn't have to wait for this view to load, he sees something, there's not just a big spinner on screen. And Google has given us Job Scheduler, uh, which has made, uh, and the GCM Network Manager for pre-Lollipop uh, devices, which 
makes all of this much, much easier and much more efficient. We can optimize for battery usage, make sure these type of prefetches, uh, especially in the background, will happen at the same time with other stuff. They will happen on the types of networks we want. The network will be available. Uh, for, like I mentioned before, you can start the app in the background, but there's a very high likelihood that the actual uh, your request will fail because they have mobile off or for various reasons. Um, and then you can do things like not prefetch on certain connection types. So we have connection class. And what we found is that on really fast networks, prefetching is useless. Don't do it. It's not worth the cost. Because you're, you're paying the amount of time users are waiting is so small that it's not worth you guessing and missing and then using resources in the background and, opt and trying to process stuff while the user is doing something. So just don't do it. It doesn't matter which type of device it is. If you're on a fast connection, there's no point in prefetching. You're not going to get a lot of benefit. Um, Unless it's intermittent and you have to deal with offline. <laughs> sure. There's lots of challenges. Um, and then one of the hardest problems in computer science is like cache invalidation. So making sure when uh, it's keeping your cache fresh. Um, this might mean like periodically uh, doing delta syncs and be like, hey, has anything changed? And the server can just say like yes or no, as opposed to just re-downloading everything all, all the time. And the story we want to tell you here is the story of comment prefetching and how we sort of uh, thought about this. If you use the Facebook app, you know that uh, you, you, you generally get the stories. Uh, and then to get to the comments, you click on the button. You, you get the comment counts, but you need to click on the button to go to them. And for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, fetching the comments is a pretty expensive operation and may take some time. So it's, uh, it seemed like a, an ideal candidate for prefetching. Uh, and it does help a lot with performance, but there is a problem. Uh, even users who use the app a lot don't necessarily click on every single uh, comment count and for every single story to see their comments. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, the majority of the stories, users don't click on the comments. They don't look at them. Uh, and so the problem is, like, how do you make it efficient? Uh, and that's a great scenario for like, a more probabilistic approach. So we try, we're going to try to guess uh, whether you can actually going to read this comment or not. Uh, in some cases, it's fairly easy, because occasionally we show you a story you've seen before, uh, but it's got more comments and more likes, in which case we're already showing you the story because it's got more comments, so it's a good one to prefetch. Uh, in other cases, a little bit trickier. I mean, there are different parameters that we take into consideration, and we actually have uh, a system on the server that does machine learning and tries to figure out like, how likely are you to actually look at the comment or not. And then the server sends this probability back to the client, and the client can look at that and say, well, do I want to prefetch or not? depending on what kind of device you're running and you know, what kind of conditions you're under. Uh, so that's an example of how probabilistic prefetching works fairly well. Uh, that also means that sometimes when you're offline or in a bad connection, you know, occasionally you, know, you click on the comment, it will take some time. But you know, we are generally pretty good about this. And so most of the time, when you actually want to look at the comment, it's going to be there for you. So now, uh, strategies for low-end phones. Low-end phones is a completely different uh, situation here, uh, because in the low-end phones, you actually have limitations of the device, uh, and you have to worry about those constraints. And you know, the biggest constraints you have to deal with is space. So it's a challenge. But uh, if you're targeting low-end phones, uh, one of the biggest um, hardship users have is that very low disk space. So often upgrading your app or downloading a new app is very challenging for the user. You have to delete one of the other four apps that they can have on the phone at the same time. Um, so developing an app that has a lightweight app footprint is paramount for, for these type of phones. Uh, next, caching is a premium. Again, very uh, low disk storage um, on the device. So if you're taking up uh, another 100 megs to store images that they may or may not see, that's not going to be a good trade-off for the user. And honestly, in for most of these users, the mobile website is their fallback. And it's like, oh, I can't install this app. I really want to use this feature, the service, this, this website I've heard about. Um, I don't have space to download, my, or I don't have a, a good enough connection. So make sure you have a good mobile website. And by good, I mean not a desktop web like site that just happens to fit inside of the window. Um, you really need to have one that is specifically focused for these type of users and these type of devices. They're the ones most likely to use this website. So um, to take a term from uh, web development, you should essentially build progressively enhanced site. Essentially make sure your site has the features necessary without JavaScript, without CSS. Because these users might have turned that off because it's slow for them. Um, and then a new thing that uh, has come out in the la uh, last year is that you can essentially have many of the benefits of uh, 
of native applications using push notifications on mobile websites. So we're going to talk about the push notifications a little bit uh, later. So you won't have to deal with these type of phones or networks. These are uh, a little bit older than what we're targeting. But it's still best to send as little data as possible over the wire. Um, we're talking about <laughs> no metadata at all. If you're not rendering on this screen at this exact point in time, do not send it over the wire. Uh, focus on like uh, essentially s s uh, formats. JSON is a great format for developers. It's kind of verbose when it comes to um, devices. So other um, essentially binary protocols such as like uh, protobufs or we use flat buffers um, uh, that allow, allow you essentially to send bytes over the wire and data over the wire without having to pay deserialization costs. Um, and so that goes back to pre-processing data on the server. Don't send metadata. If you're concatenating a bunch of strings, don't do it on the client, do it on the server. Um, Minimize background work and I.O. because you only have one core. So uh, it's going to interfere with things that are happening on the UI. It's going to be pretty crappy. Um, and then minimize the number of simultaneous requests. Often on 2G networks and low-end networks, um, you don't have the available upstream bandwidth to send multiple requests at the same time. So essentially throttle yourself to one request at a time. Yeah, and uh, you know, some things you just can't do, like on low-end devices, are, at least we haven't figured out a way to do that. For example, how would you deal with intermittency, like if you don't have the cache space uh, and you can't really prepatch ahead of time? Uh, pretty hard, but you can, you can do uh, you know, fairly well with uh, in situations where the network is just, is just slow. Uh, so the tail here is the mobile web and uh, push notifications. Uh, you know, the one thing I want to mention about mobile web is there is a misconception that uh, you know, the, uh, on Android, you know, mobile web is going down in terms of numbers, and the native applications are going up. Uh, and actually, th what, what's true is both are going up. Like, as a lot of users are switching from uh, feature phones, I mean, a lot of them are switching to devices which are just uh, you know, not powerful enough to run some of the uh, uh, some of the functionality we have in the main app, and you know they, they opt for using the uh, mobile web instead. And you know we think we think with for some devices it's a perfectly great solution to do that. So the usage is growing for both of those, and I think for most other apps that that's true as well. Uh, and push notifications is just a really exciting topic because up until this year, uh, you know what push notification the browser, you know wh where did that come from, right? Uh, and so uh, this year we actually uh, we originally partnered with the UC Mini. Uh, and UC Browser, which is a very popular browser in uh, China and India, uh, to, to provide push notifications. Uh, and you know, we did that for, with UC Mini, and then we did it with Opera. And in both cases, we saw uh, just a, a tremendous response from, from the users. I mean, they just, you know, they're active push notifications, a great functionality, and so they visit the app more often. Uh, and then we work with Google. Uh, Google is very interested in uh, building it as a platform feature, uh, and they did that. I mean, in Chrome right now, you actually can have uh, different apps do the same thing that we did and uh, provide push notifications for them. So they have a platform, and apps can actually do that now. Uh, and they're seeing similar response for all of them. I mean, it's just been great for users who uh, you know, can't have a, a native app uh, installed on their on the device or prefer to, to use a, a mobile web instead. Uh, Firefox is the last major mobile browser. And uh, I mean, they announced recently that the support for push notifications is also coming sometime this year. So everybody's moving in that direction. That's pretty great. Can I stop for a question? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we've had a lot of materials. We have about 15 minutes more of, uh, of uh, sort of more material to cover. But we wanted to stop and see if people have any questions uh, before we go on about the material we just presented. If people have general questions, they can also come out afterwards. Anybody? Yep, there's a question there. So, right, right. So the question, the question is, uh, like a lot of stuff here is pretty high end, you know, like and maybe utilizing the server power and uh, require a lot of development work. Uh, for companies who are just starting to think about the mobile market, uh, the emerging markets, uh, like what are the what are the you know the first few things they could do to make things better? Alex, you want to take that? Sure. Um, I think a lot of the things that we're talking about, things like caching data and, and optimizing for um, your app not being online at this very second, are kind of just user experience. And those are just, you just have to be in those 
have those assumptions when you're building your product. It's really hard to go back afterwards and being like, oh, I'm gonna redesign it to work in these things. It's quite challenges. I, challenging, I know, we're doing it. Um, but for, uh, it's when you're building a, for a small company, you can move much faster and you can do a lot. Of, but things like caching data, it's not hard, like images and things like that. The, that's no-brainer type stuff. Um, Prefetching and lists and things like that are also not Understanding your users and their flow, understanding who your users are, so implementing connection class in your class, just purely for your analytics first. That's actually most important, what we found. Just implement it as part of your analytics, try to understand what's going on, and then optimize for scenarios that you see. Like you, you might see a login flow is like broken and has a huge drop off on your class 2010 devices. So then you can grab a year class 2010 device and then optimize for that as opposed to trying to do everything upfront, which is challenging. So data first, analytics first, and then like find the, the big problems in your app. Yeah, and, and the reason we open source things like year class and network connection classes too, because like a lot of engineers were, you know, uh, you know in other companies were asking, hey, what can we do? And we thought that would be useful for them as well. But I mean, there are some, you know, basic measures, Alex yeah. said, you know, just, so, just caching. And we're going to talk about a, f a few things r like right now, some tools and some ideas that we've essentially built into our apps to essentially solve this issue because it is a very difficult problem. Any more questions before I move on? All right, uh, so moving on to testing. Like, uh, you know, we're, you know, most of us are here. Uh, we have the connections that we have, and they're pretty good. Uh, how do we test for uh, bad networks? How do we test for how the apps work, our apps work on bad networks? So one of the things we built last year um, is called Augmented Traffic Control, and it's a tool we've open sourced. It's a server you run on one of the computers in your office, um, and then it provides, essentially, you connect to it via Wi-Fi on your phone. So essentially all of the traffic from your app or other apps on your phone could go through uh, augmented traffic control. And then there's presets on there so you can, for example, see what does my app feel like on 2G in rural India or when there's a black hole and I'm sending packets out and everything is telling me I have a connection but nothing is coming back. How does my app behave in, in these type of uh, scenarios? Um, so it's, it's all open source and you guys can l look it up, but essentially it's just a server s somewhere with a, some simple software that will um, both handle like latency, bandwidth, and also things like uh, intermittency. So like, you know, some requests will be faster than others, they'll be bursty, things like that. It's a more complex modeling. Um, Next, Jenny Motion is out here, and they're uh, a, a great tool and a great um, a, a emulator. So they've built uh, the ability to throttle your network, uh, and they have uh, presets like 3G and 4G and Edge, um, so you can easily see what it's like. I actually got stuck on one of these modes the other day, and I was like, why is my app so slow? Everything is loading, and I was like, oh, I'm actually on Edge. I was like, this is what people are uh, feeling every single day. It is terrible, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and then there's also the Android emulator, and it's, uh, it provides um, uh, essentially parameters you can pass in to tell it, I want to be on Edge, I want to be on GPS, I want to be on Wi-Fi, and then like what the actual delay and speed uh, is for those networks. So, uh, I mean, so a lot of these technologies, I mean, they, I mean, they're sort of Wi-Fi throttling technologies or, you know, some variations of that. Uh, uh, and Wi-Fi throttling is used by other companies as well, and ETC is not the only solution for that. Uh, the, the, the tricky thing about Wi-Fi throttling is that you can really dog food. You can test, but you can't really dog food. You can't just take that on, on a bus and try doing things, right? Uh, or like things you do in a daily life. Uh, and you know, dog fooding is very important. Like when we develop our apps, we rely on dog fooding a lot uh, to sort of understand how, how the features feel and how they work. Uh, and so that's a challenge because you know, with Wi-Fi throttling and ATC, we don't actually get that. Uh, so we, we have a couple of ideas and like uh, uh, think uh, to how to solve that. And uh, one of them is uh, VPN throttling. I mean, uh, just building a VPN app uh, which can just throttle you as well and can throttle you all the time and all the apps on your phone all the time. Uh, and you know, it can work with a car and network and then just throttle it. Uh, uh, so that's one dog footing solution. But another one, and just to the question about how do you do simple things, uh, is uh, uh, you know, don't ast underestimate the power of a sleep uh, statement, right, in your app. Uh, if you just you know, if if you, if you just have it for for the dog footers or for the engineers, uh, where you just slow down your network calls, all of them. I mean, that's actually a great way to model latency. 
uh, you know, just have it parameterizable so you can change this. Uh, you know, but that's uh, that's one way to do that. Uh, and another way, uh, another way, simple way to do things, uh, like to, for example, to demonstrate how, what intermittency might look like is just fail the network calls. Uh, you know, you're not going to get the uh, the entire you know like richness of how the networks work and how many ways they can fail. Uh, but it'll give you a basic idea of what happens uh, when your network call start, starts failing randomly and how the app can handle this. Uh, and the story I want to tell, uh, tell here is a story of two GTUs, this, which is something we started doing uh, internally. Uh, and we basically use those uh, te uh, techniques, just you know, a simple sleep statement to get the latency and the, uh, you know, just you know, have a randomly returned network failures, uh, even if the network is perfectly fine. Uh, and then we, uh, we ping employees uh, every Tuesday, if you're uh, on Android device, uh, and we ask you if you want to come in and, and you know, participate in the 2G Tuesdays. Uh, and when you do, you get those latencies and you get those intermittences. Again, not the entire richness, but you get enough uh, to actually generate a lot of interesting bugs. Uh, so obviously users are encouraged to use and dog food the app as long as they can, as long as they want to. Uh, and that's been a great source of bug reports, things which we otherwise would not have found uh, until the, the app went into the, into the production. Uh, and it's also a great way to build empathy, like Alex was, uh, w w was talking about. Like, I know nothing like just seeing a view like that uh, you know, for five, 10 seconds uh, to sort of understand what the problem is and really, really feel the empathy with the people who, uh, who have to go for this every day. So next, my favorite thing, because it's actually the solution um, to all these problems, is configuration. Um, so we build our apps, and we usually optimize for a certain scenario, usually our scenario, I open the app and I click these buttons and it works and I close it and I'm like, it's done, it works, I guarantee it. Then we ship it and someone clicks and then it breaks and you're like, why did you click it that way? So um, yes, we're terrible at this. However, constants are bad. Um, that's what we found is that, uh, I like the quote, the only thing that is constant is change. So um, we essentially have allowed most, if not all, of our features of our app to have parameters for everything that could be configured. So things that would normally be a static final const in your class is now a parameter. It's still a const, but it could be overridden on the server. And so what we do is then we allows us to optimize all sorts of different interactions and feelings inside of our app for your current device, like. We showed less images on screen depending on like your, not only device size, but uh, your year class. It's, there's some devices that have big screens and very little RAM. It is really annoying. Um, some, it's, it's, or if, 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 if these devices don't have a lot of disk space, we reduce the cache. Um, if an animation we think is really cool does not perform well, we can just turn it off on certain devices. It's like, oh, year class 2010, there's no point in making the user sit and watch a stuttering animation. We just turn it off and show the screen. Um, and then we can optimize for the current network, which is some of the most powerful stuff that we've been able to do. So uh, examples being like having fewer or more concurrent connections when you're on Wi-Fi, make all the requests at the same time. It doesn't matter. Uh, if you're on 2G, Make one request at a time. Um, if you're on 2G, download an image resolution that will load in an appropriate amount of time. Um, even though it should be 500 by 400 pixels, um, if that's going to take you 30 seconds to download, no one's going to wait there 30 seconds for this image to download. Download a lower res version um, to at least show the user in 5, 10 seconds. Um, and then you can, I, we, I mentioned chunking before, you can change the chunk sizes, and then when to prefetch, don't prefetch on fast networks, prefetch more on low networks, et, et cetera. Um, so experimentation's good. Once you have all these parameters, step number two, and uh, it's uh, uh, one of the more, it's harder for smaller companies, but you can start out small. Uh, essentially, start running A-B tests with different parameters. Don't assume you know as the developer, I know this is how our users should use. You're not Steve Jobs. Like, you need to, like, uh, to make sure your app works for the scenarios um, that your users are actually using. Um, so um, 
when you're looking at this data, don't settle for the average. Make sure you use the analytics available to you, year class, connection class, country, to really make sure that you're not hurting a certain segment of the population. It might be on average good, but it might hurt a small a segment of the population uh, really bad. Uh, we found, for example, out of memory errors for one feature was really bad on one thing, even though for overall it increased engagement and things like that for other people. Um, and then once you're, you've done that, you're not done, like you're never done. Especially if you have an app that has a long life cycle and is living over several years, the people who are using your app will change over time. You know, there'll be early adopters first and then they'll be like grandmas later. They use the app different ways, they have different patterns. You have to make sure that um, what was true a year ago is still true now. And uh, our tail here is a tail of mobile config, which is basically our configuration system uh, for doing these things. Uh, the, uh, the key part of the system is we actually want to push uh, a lot of these parameters from the server so we can quickly adjust them or use the power of the server to do analysis and decide, hey, for this type of users, this is the best value. Uh, and so that's precisely what we do. So different users can get different parameters and different values. Uh, so the behavior of the app, uh, especially on the infrastructure side, adjusts to what we think is best for them based on experimentation. Uh, that, uh, that system allows us to experiment on things in any time. So even if we are uh, you know, pretty sure that this is the best configuration parameter, it might not be the best configuration parameter six months later. So we can repeat this and do it again. Uh, in the meantime, I mean, server will just feed you constants, right? From the client perspective, it's just something comes from, from the sky, uh, and they just use that, right? What, how it's actually said is not, is not relevant. Uh, and you know, one tricky thing about this, you know, in mobile world, uh, especially in Android, people don't upgrade very quickly. Uh, I mean, you still have a lot of old versions out there, uh, and you know, you have to sort of honor that. So, uh, if you ever build a system like that, you have to worry about versioning uh, and making sure that you can deal with that. Uh, there are many different ways to deal with that, uh, you know, and uh, but that's that's one of the problems you have to solve. And then, uh, sort of going beyond A-B testing, I want to talk about Facebook Bandit. It's certainly on the high end of what you can do, uh, but it's pretty exciting for us, so we, we wanted to mention that. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's built by Facebook Research, so a lot of the stuff is uh, you know, pretty complex, so we just want to talk about sort of the, uh, the basic things uh, involved in the system. It's an advanced experimentation framework. Uh, it's common in the industry. It's called uh, multi arm Bandit. Uh, that happens to be the Facebook version of that, the Facebook Bandit. Uh, what it allows you to do is to experiment with a large number of configurations. And it's very quickly decides uh, how to narrow down to just the configurations which are likely to produce the best results. It also very quickly decides how to uh, throw out configurations which are producing results which, less, which are worse than the status quo, which is important because you don't want to uh, you know, have experiments out there which actually degrade user experience. Uh, so that system helps us to get, uh, get there quickly. And it, it allows us to optimize for competing variables. You know, quite often for these configurations, uh, you're not just thinking about one variable. Uh, a great example here is data usage. I mean, you, you do data usage so your performance improves. Uh, and users spend more time working with the app than they do looking at the spinner. But data usage itself is, of course, one of the parameters. And you don't want to drive that value too high. Uh, and the, uh, the story here is the story of how we did the prefetching while scrolling. Uh, so as we scroll through the news feed, uh, we prefetch stories ahead of time uh, because we don't want you to hit that moment where you're sort of visibly looking at the, uh, at the spinner while we're trying to get the next set of stories. Uh, and originally when we did this, we just said, well, you know, we'll just EBIT test, uh, look at a few values, and we find out that generally, worldwide, uh, 10 is a fantastic number, uh, and, it's to be the, and it's, it could be the best number, uh, and we just will prefetch 10 stories ahead. When you, have, when you are 10 stories from the moment where we don't have any more stories, we will go ahead and prefetch. Uh, and then when the bandit came onto the scene, we decided that we're going to run this for the bandit. And uh, so we can figure out uh, you know, the best configurations for different networks in particular, because we had this hunch that for the different networks, we might get something different. And uh, Bandit actually went for 27 different configurations. Uh, a configuration is something like that, like a little matrix over here, uh, different number of stories that you prefetch ahead for uh, on different connections. Uh, and first, they sort of ran them and look at what the data usage would look like uh, from different configurations. But the, the real interesting thing here is optimization for multiple parameters because, yeah, you can reduce data usage by doing you know, fewer than 10, but you want to do that in such a way that users don't end up you know, looking at that spinner because the, whole, the, the entire work is there to make sure that uh, you can actually get to, to the stories uh, before user gets to them. And so they are, the engagement continues to be high because they're engaging with the app instead of waiting for the, uh, for the stories to load. 
And so when you when you actually map this to into seven different cases, uh, you see this pattern, which you know Pareto frontier is just a fancy word of saying like for all the other configurations here, uh, there is a better configuration where you can improve on one axis without sacrificing anything on the other. Right? And so the tool helps us to figure this, figure this out. And actually, it turns out that there are just four different values out of the 27 that are like that, which you know, cannot be improved any further on one or the other access. Uh, two of them are extreme. You, know, you can obviously uh, run with no data usage, but then you're not going to get much out of this. Uh, or you can just say, uh, you know, you're going to get a lot, but data usage is uh, you know, it's still a concern and you have to worry about. And then you just down to two values. And then, then you can A-B test on these two values and figure out what the best value is. And I let Alex finish on that because that was one of his projects. Yes. So we start off with 10. That seemed like a good number. Uh, we tested out 27 different configuration. Um, and what we found is that 10 was actually a pretty good number. We did a pretty decent job for certain types of users. Um, and it didn't hurt anyone else. But we could actually optimize when you're on good and excellent networks to prefetch less aggressively. So this actually reduced data usage for these people dramatically, because now they didn't essentially download things they didn't need, um, and also decreased server CPU. Uh, we saw like, what is that, 57% of users um, were on Wi-Fi. So 57% of users used to, or some percentage of that 57%, um, used to prefetch relatively aggressively when they didn't need to. So we were able to drastically reduce server CPU, which costs money, um, at, without actually hurting engagement. No one saw any more spinners. Uh, probably no one noticed. Um, so then we just now have one set of values, but we do it based, instead of 10, we now do it based on connection class. So you can see we actually have a JSON configuration option uh, object that looks exactly like that. We say when you're on excellent, use three. When you're on good, use five. And these will change, right? You might be on an excellent connection now, and you turn off Wi-Fi, and you go walk out the door, and now you need to do another fetch. Now you get the value 10. So it's, it's, these values can change over the lifetime of the, of the app. And uh, that's it. That was a lot. That, that's, that's our presentation. So thanks very much for coming. And, uh, <laughs>